Good afternoon. I think it just switched to afternoon. So I'm very pleased to be here with you today because I can't, this is really an important issue and one in which I can't believe the misinformation that gets pushed around and believed. So if you have read or listened to recent news reports about state fiscal problems or pensions, you would think that pensions were driving the current state and local deficits, wouldn't you, from what you've heard? But that's far from true. So let me give you a nugget to think about while I talk about some of the background here. In Wisconsin, the most recent data show that the contributions for all state and local government pensions, including for the vilified teachers and yours, accounted for 3.6% of state and local budgets, just 3.6%. Even though in Wisconsin, in most cases, the state was picking up the employee share of the contributions pursuant to bargaining agreements that had been made a while ago. So I'll come back to this. But first, I want to clearly distinguish the current cyclical state deficits from the issue of pension funding. The two have very little to do with each other other than the fact that the cyclical deficits are being used as a weapon to attack pensions. So in, for the upcoming state fiscal year, fiscal year 2012, which will start in July in most states, state budget shortfalls are about $112 billion in 44 states in D.C. And they're big. On average, they're 18 percent of budgets in those states. And um, there's, there are three, re and we, we see local governments also having budget deficits. And there are three reasons. First, state revenues remain 11% below their pre-recession level. If you don't have the revenues coming in, you're going to have a deficit. And at the local level, we have press downward pressure on property taxes because of the housing problems. The second reason is the needs have increased since the beginning of the recession. You have declining revenues, increasing needs, you have a deficit. There are more children in public schools, a lot more people wanting to be retrained in community colleges and universities, and a lot more people who have lost their jobs, have lost their income, and have come on to Medicaid. And the third reason is the federal, federal stimulus that helped deal with all of this is ending. So that's why there are cyclical deficits. These are big costs, but cyclical means cyclical. It goes down and then it goes up again. State and local revenues will recover and will be better able to cover costs when the economy fully recovers. So where do pensions fit into this? So pensions are paid to retirees, as you know, from state and local pension trust funds. It's only the contributions to the trust funds that are made from the general revenue. In 2008, which is the latest year which we have comprehensive data, pension contributions across all of the states averaged 3.8% of state and local budgets, less than 4%, less than $1.25. And you note that if you remember what I said about Wisconsin, it's got a below average contribution. Now you have heard a lot about pensions being underfunded, right? On average, they are a bit underfunded right now. So what happened was we had two recessions in the early, the recession in 2001 and this one that we're just getting over. And those two recessions reduced the value of the assets uh, in those funds, okay, because we had drops in the, in the market and the value of the pension funds went down. And second, those recessions, when they did cause general fund budget deficits, made it difficult in some jurisdictions to make the proper contributions to the pension funds. Before these two recessions, state and local pension funds taken together were 100% funded. 
It is the recessions that have caused the problem. Now pensions are about 75% funded and they're going to go down closer to maybe 70% funded. This is a problem that needs to be addressed, but let me emphasize that it is not a crisis. You don't need to do really extraordinary things to meet a crisis because there is no crisis. States and localities have managed to build up their pension trust funds in the past without outside intervention. Actually, the a whole idea of pre-funding pension, fu pension benefits really began in the 1970s, not so long ago. And between 1980 and 2007, state and local pension funds accumulated about $3 billion in assets. There's reason to assume they can do that again to fill go back to 100% funding. And most states and localities have time to remedy this. It's not something that you need to do today or even tomorrow while the economy is still weak. So Alicia Munell, who's like a national expert on pensions at Boston College, explained even, and this is a quote, even after the worst market crash in decades, state and local plans do not face an immediate liquidity crisis. Most plans will be able to cover benefits for the next 15 or 20 years. So there's time to deal with this. And in most states, it will only take a modest increase in funding or sensible changes to eligibility and benefits or getting rid of what some people view as abuses like spiking, that, that should be sufficient to remedy underfunding. If you use the traditional way of looking at pension funding, an increase on average from what I said is the current 3.8% of budgets that's spent to 5% of budgets would do the trick. That's not a big leap. Now there are some states that have grossly underfunded their pensions. <coughs> in past years or granted retroactive benefits without funding them. We all know that Illinois, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania have more serious pension problems and there's problems in Colorado, Kentucky, Kansas, and California. So they may have to raise that to more than 5% contributions, but it is nevertheless in most places doable. Now, why, so there, but so if that were the case, there wouldn't be any fuss, right? Maybe. But there are some people who disagree with these numbers. There are some people who are saying the pension hole is much deeper and is, in fact, a crisis. You may have heard that there are $3 trillion, a big and scary number, in unfunded liabilities in pension funds. Now the $3 trillion number comes from economists who measure future costs assuming what is known as a riskless rate of return on investments, as if the pension fund only invested in treasury bonds. But that's not what pension funds do. They do not and should not only invest in treasury bonds. The average historical rate of return on pension investments has been about 8%. It may or may not be exactly 8% going forward, but it's quite unlikely to be just 4%, which would be the Treasury number. The $3 trillion number is a construct that makes some sense in economic analysis. And I think it's important to, real, to recognize it's not just junk, but it doesn't mean what people think it means. The reason they come up with that number is that the constitutions and laws of most states prevent major changes in pension promises to current employees and retirees. That's something good that I'm sure you are very fond of and you like and that makes sense. So economists say these are absolute promises so they should be valued as if invested to guarantee the rate of return. And you only can guarantee your rate of return if you do something like treasury bills with a 4% return. But this is the key point to understand. While you can acknowledge the economics of, the, uh, of this, the liabilities calculated at the riskless rate does not represent the amount that, that has to be deposited into pension funds to meet their obligations. Those are two separate things. Investment earnings account for 
of the amount of money, the assets in pension funds. You know, your contributions and your employer contributions together make up 40% and the rest is built up through investment earnings. So it's important to actually look at what realistic returns will be. Um, and if you look at an 8% rate of return, then you don't have $3 trillion in, in unfunded liabilities. You have $700 billion in unfunded liabilities. Now, that may still sound like a big number, but that's the number I used when I said that you, could, you only had to increase contributions from 3.8% of budgets to 5% of budgets. Now, you may be going bleary-eyed and saying, this is a pretty technical argument. It is pretty technical. But it's important because this $3 trillion number has become kind of like a club. And it's being used to beat on several different, um, on pensions in a several different ways. And in particular, I'd like to talk today about federal legislation that is being sponsored by Congressman Devin Nunes and, and Daryl Issa, both of California, and Paul Ryan of Wisconsin that would require states to report their pension liabilities to the federal government, which they've never done before, all, and that to require them to report all their cal by calculating on this riskless rate, on this 4%, or whatever it turns out to be. And if they do not comply, they would lose their right to issue tax-exempt bonds, a huge and disproportionate penalty. Now, there are several problems with this legislation. The stated goal is transparency, and nowadays everybody's in favor of transparency. And they say they want to allow people to compare pension plans across states and localities on the same basis. So it sounds good, and it's fooled a number of people, but it isn't good. One of the actual goals seems to be to create pressure to abandon traditional defined benefit pension plans. The Wall Street Journal, in describing the proposed legislation, said, and I quote, their bill would encourage governments to switch to defined contribution plans by revealing the true magnitude of their unfunded liabilities, unquote. Congressman Nunes liked that so much, he put it on his blog. Congressman Nunes also recently told a group of, government, of California government officials in promoting his bill, quote, so what this will only set up what the folks in the private sector figured out a long time ago, that you have to get away from the f defined benefit plan pensions and somehow get to a defined contribution 401k style plan. That's what he said. So that's obviously what he wants to do. Now, keeping strong defined benefit plans matters to you and it matters to other public employees. But it's probably not the public argument that's going to win the day and lead most people to see the problems with this proposed legislation. I think that a lot of people in this country now have a bad case of what I might call pension envy. And they're not so supportive of maintaining um, DB plans when they don't have them themselves. So I think for public arguments, we need to look at other problems with this bill. First. It would confuse and mislead the public and policymakers into believing that the amounts states and localities need to deposit into their pension plans each year are much larger than the amounts actually needed. So if you, on average, if you figure things on this basis, you, it, it would, um, deposits would have to rise to about 9% of budgets, not to 5% of budgets, and you're beginning to get to a point where that would put a lot of pressure to cut salaries and benefits, but also to cut other parts of the budgets, like education and health care and other public, and public safety people that, peop, that programs that people really value. So you'd have that kind of pressure coming from that, this. Second, Mr. Nunes says the bill is necessary because it's now impossible to compare pensions one to the other across states. This is true. This is very true. And I would agree that addition, additional transparency and comparability would be desirable, but we don't need ham-handed federal law for that to happen. 
And actually, the bill requires reporting on only two of the several issues that go into determining pension liabilities, this discount rate or rate of return, and um, to, mar to consider assets at their market value. But that calls into question the goals of transparency and comparability because um, that those aren't all the issues and all the measures that go into figuring out the funding of a pension. So, you know, you have to wonder, is that really the goal or is the ending DB plans the goal? So third, it's not necessary, this legislation isn't necessary to achieve transparency and comparability. For the past four years, the Government Standards Accounting Board, it's called GASB, which is the, which sets out financial accounting rules for governments. And GASB rules, while they're not mandatory, are generally voluntarily obeyed by all lo state and local governments because if you don't go along with the GASB rules, then you have financial analysts and bond rating agencies saying there's something wrong with you and you have to pay more interest in order to float your bonds. So GASB is generally considered to be the authority for how state and local governments do their finances. And for the past four years, GASB has been working on new standards for pension financial reporting. I should emphasize that this whole business with the 8% rate of return follows current GASB standards, and GASB is revising those standards now. And these standards will be comprehensive, and they will lo look at all elements of the pension calculation and reporting. Now, GASB isn't sitting in a room by themselves and doing this. They haven't, by fiat, like the Nunes bill does, decided what it should be. They've done research, they've held meetings, they've taken testimony from more than 100 stakeholders and you know all kinds, including all the unions. And the new standards are expected to come out next year. And states and localities will follow them because if I said, the financial analysts and bond raters look unfavorably on governments that don't. Now, not everybody likes every element in the new GASB standards. And the, they're still in draft and they may still change um, according to a lot of comments people have made. But even if you don't like everything in them, it's much better than having than the standard the Nunes bill imposes and it's far less likely to have the negative consequences. It does not require reporting based on the riskless rate. So finally, the Nunes Bill requirements, which would publicize unrealistically high pension liabilities that don't exist, are likely to spook the bond market, even if you know, they don't impose this draconian penalty of losing the tax exemption. You're going to have a lot of people who don't really understand stake in local finances looking at these numbers and saying, hey, that's a huge liability. I better not invest here. And so it would result in higher costs of borrowing for states and localities and harm their ability to build roads and highways and bridges and schools and maybe even firehouses. So by contrast, the GASB standards are likely to be accepted as positive for state and local borrowing. Now, I should say that uh, this morning we put out a paper that I wrote only on, which is exclusively on this piece of legislation. It's on our website and I can get it to you guys to, um, and because I think that this is kind of a sleeper thing. If you say, I am this, I'm in favor of transparency and comparability, well, then everybody says, well, that's great. And you have people who shouldn't be thinking that this bill is great saying, oh, I'll sign on to that. So I think it's really important to understand what the bill really does and what it really intends to do and um, to make that known. So to conclude, let me say again, there are issues in state and local pensions that need to be addressed, but pensions are not causing the current state deficits and there is no crisis. The fix required is relatively modest in most states, and even though there are a few states that will need to do more. No federal intervention is necessary. State and local governments will manage their liabilities as they always have. Thank you very much. Great.